public accounts for purposes of looking into the annual report of the Department of Community Safety and also the Auditor General report of the department and its entity, which is the liquor board. Now, uh, we are going to conduct the meeting in two parts as usual. The first part is going to be a closed session of the committee together with the Auditor General of South Africa, as well as the Audit Committee of the department, as well as the entity as well. And then after that, we'll move to the second part of the meeting where we'll be joined by the department. Now, for purposes of us starting and also for record purposes, I'm just going to ask the honorable okay. members to please introduce themselves. Good afternoon, Chair. Andrikus van der Westhuizen, a full time member of this committee. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, I'm Nominko, and a member of the committee. Thank you very much. Uh, I know we've got apology from Honorable uh, Go. Uh, and of course, uh, I think you've also received okay. that uh, apology. Uh, also, we are being assisted by Mr. Dustin Davids, as the procedural officer, as well as the IT. Dustin is handling the IT issues. Now, I'm just going to give over to the Auditor General and the Audit Committee to introduce themselves, and thereafter we proceed with the meeting. Thank you, Chairperson. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Melanie Joffe, and I was the Engagement Manager on the Department of Community Safety. Thank you, Honourable Chair. Good afternoon, Honourable Members. I'm the Senior Manager responsible for the for the NTG, uh, Liquor Authority. Thanks. Good afternoon, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Um, I'm, my name is Peter Strauss, and I'm the Chair of the Audit Committee of the Department. Good afternoon, Chair. I'm Francois Barnard, Chairperson of the Western Cape Liquor Authority Audit Committee. Good afternoon, Chair Ashley Alkers. I'm from the Auditor General's Office, Deputy Business Executive. Thank you, Thank you very much. And then having had those introductions, I'm going to hand over first to the Auditor General to present to us the Auditor General's report of the of both the department as well as the entity. And as I normally say, just uh, take us to talk us through the report, raising those, those salient points that uh, needs to be brought to our attention without necessarily.
the Standing Committee on Public Accounts uh, Committee meeting of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament for purposes of looking into the annual report of the Department of Community Safety and its entity, which is the Liquor Authority, and also to look at the Auditor General's report as well as the Audit Committee report of the department as well as its entity, which is the Liquor Authority. This is the second part of the meeting we are holding. Uh, the first part having been a part where we were briefed by the Auditor General and the Audit Committee about the audit outcomes of the department. That was a closed session of the meeting. The second part is the open session of the meeting. In other words, it's open even to members of the public. Those who might have wanted to join us online as well as those who might uh, come to join us physically in the meeting for purposes of them interacting and also asking questions on the annual uh, on the annual report of the department and the entity. <laughs> now we are opening up the meeting to the public because it was advertised as such. It was advertised in uh, three in newspapers in all the three official languages of the province. Now, the way we are going to conduct the meeting, we will deal with the reports of both the department as well as that of the entity simultaneously. In other words, members uh, of the committee, the members of the legislature can ask questions on both reports at the same time. And then we will allow the department to respond to the question as well as the liquor authority as well to respond if there are questions that have been directed to them. Now, as we are about to start, Honorable Minister, I welcome uh, uh, to you and your department as well as the HOD and also to the liquor authorities as well. We are welcome. This is a part of the accountability process that we are conducting. We are pleased that we have responded positively together with the department by your attendance. Want to, if you've got any opening remarks that you'd like to make, I'm going to hand over to you. And thereafter, if the HOD also want to make some opening remarks, I will allow the HOD to do so. Honorable Minister. Chairperson. Thank you so much that we are able to appear today to all the members. Good afternoon. It's by no stretch of the imagination that we are fully aware that Friday afternoons are often considered as the graveyard shift. But I have no doubt that as a scoper, you are committed and that we are here to answer questions, to engage. And at this point, Chairperson, it is not a forceful removal, but I will request that the CFO as well as the CEO and the chairperson of the Liquor Authority join us closer to this side. I appreciate your view that we can do it in one go because the values, our programs align because we see that where there is an abuse of alcohol, it is often linked directly to crime. So as they are getting up, Chairperson, and make their way um, to sit over here, um, to sit over here, it is literally, Chairperson, as a show that we are in agreement with how we will handle SCOPA, but more importantly, that um, the Liquor Authority, together with the Department, working hand in hand to ensure that, yes, both the department as well as the liquor authority have received uh, clean audits. And I am happy once again to be here and also good afternoon to all the members that is online. What you have noticed now is that there has been a little friction, people moving around because chairperson we have seen criminals and gangsters have become deeply organized. And we have had to make certain shifts. We have had to refocus. We have had to, to reprioritize 
in terms of meeting the safety needs um, in, in our province, but we are happy to be here. I'm joined by dedicated uh, officials that is committed to ensuring that we not only receive clean audits, but there's actually value for money. Thank you. HOD. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson and members. Uh, good afternoon. Apology that we are playing some musical chairs here. Um, just um, also grateful for this opportunity to account uh, to the committee for our work over the past year. We're very proud of our 14th consecutive clean audit outcome. Uh, but as Minister has indicated, it's not just about a clean audit, uh, but also uh, the service delivery to the persons of the Western Cape. And we'd like to also acknowledge the clean audit outcome of the entity, uh, the Liquor Authority. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, now, honorable members, I'm going to go to the report of both the department as well as the liquor authority, which has been uh, circulated uh, to you. Now, you know we are dealing with part C and part E of the report. But uh, in order to deal with this report orderly, we are going to follow a sequence of first starting with C of both reports. Again, uh, assuming that uh, uh, we are taking the report as read. And then if there are members who would like to ask questions on the report, I'm going to allow that opportunity for those members who want to ask questions on part C of the report of the department as well as the report of the liquor authority. Honorable Fanny Vestazen. Honorable Gondo as well. Honorable Fanny Vestazen. Thank you, Chair. If I could ask that uh, we page to page 98 and, and 99. I think it was it, it is, uh, wonderful to see that, you know, at the beginning of this financial year, there were no uh, uh, open cases in terms of uh, uh, fraud and, and, and loss investigations. That quite a number of them were then reported and uh, that quite a number were closed. Now, I see that at the end of this financial year, there were three open cases. Now, you know, if the case was uh, opened a day or, to, or so before the end of the financial year, one can understand why it has not yet been finalized. But perhaps if we could get an indication of the age of those those cases that were still open at the end of, uh, of March, uh, and also in terms of the, the internal investigations, those two cases there, again, uh, it's commendable that you know, of the six reported cases, four uh, could be closed. But uh, you know, perhaps we could just get an indication as to as to why there was a, a regression. As, as I've said before, there may be very good cause for that. Then on page 99, uh, may I say, Chair, that I am a great believer in in having a skilled public service, and therefore the uh, the training interventions uh, that were undertaken, I think, is, is really positive and something that I support in full. But then I noticed that, uh, you know, in terms of some of the uh, training interventions, very few staff were able to be exposed to that. And perhaps if we could just get an indication of, of why do we find such a huge difference between uh, certain training. It could again be that, you know, the majority of the staff, existing staff, have already undergone training, and surely we also don't want people to repeat uh, uh, training. And then uh, I think what is nice and what has been reported is the issue of e-learning, which I think is is, is the, the future to a large extent in terms of in-service training. Uh, but then again, I do see that there's been quite a, a significant difference in the numbers of people that 
that attended that e-training and and all in all it seems as if the e-training numbers are still uh, relatively low so perhaps if somebody would would just mind explaining those figures and whether we can expect similar figures for the upcoming year or whether in this current year uh, you know training has been uh, upped and 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 increased in terms of of the staff thank you very much Thank you very much, Honorable Van Vestesen. Honorable Ngondlo. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I've got one um, one question I would like uh, to sort of ask uh, the the minister. And uh, before I get to my other questions, and I think. This would have been a question uh, one would have asked uh, also in the previous uh, engagements of annual reports uh, with this department. And that has to do with the location of the liquor board in your department. And I'm asking you as the executing authority, um, based on the understanding that um, the, the approach Uh, of having a liquor authority within the Department of Community Safety is something unique, particularly in this province versus others, Um, which I think I I would recall in the explanation, it was on the basis of the interface that you'd already spoken to of liquor and crime. But uh, I think there's 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 a perspective, I would say, that continues, um, and I would want to understand where is this department around that question of the economic aspect, because beyond liquor uh, being part in terms of the outcome of a product, you know, it is still an, an, an industry and an enterprising industry. And amongst others in the engagement as somebody who sits in the economic development space is the fact that the limitation of placing this department, um, placing the liquor authority in this department is the fact that you are dealing with people that are looking at it from a law enforcement point of view, criminalizing point of view, and such has got its own limitations. And actually, I think the last time there was a conversation and liquor traders associations would have actually made a submission to the premier in the previous administration. And there was a conversation that says the matter is under whatever process of the liquor authority. And I'm trying to understand where is that, but also as an executing authority, how do you balance, you know, um, the needs of a, an entity that is under you, uh, given that, um, and I'm not underestimating the expertise of your team, but I'm just saying they are not in the economic space. Um, they are is different. And what do you do with the stakeholders, which are primary stakeholders who have got, you know, um, economic activity type of uh, concerns? How do you deal with that? And at what point are we seeing this liquor authority being moved to the economic de- de- department where it, they, they are supposed to go. So that's the first question around governance that I would like to, to ask. And then I just wanted to ask, I think, uh, just a few questions in the uh, liquor board um, governance. Uh, I see in page 50, Mr. Hrodbom, um, in has got, um, I'm not sure whether you are overworking him when I look at uh, as a deputy chair. I'm not sure whether you are overworking him, which is why he's got, um, you know, um, a high level of other reinvestment uh, than others. Uh, I'm sure he's highly overworked. Uh, so, so please, uh, maybe you can explain so that there's equitable distribution uh, of work uh, in the in, in the space. Uh, but also, I think uh, um, I think it's Miss Crystal in page 52. Is she, is, I think it's a she. Uh, is she still with the, is it the audit committee? Is she still with the audit committee? Because I see zero meetings um, uh, attended in terms of uh, what what is in the report. Let me stop there for now, Chair. Honorable Barnes online. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I have one question on page 92. 
the bullet above the key emerging risks. Possible that is on the department or on the on the entity? department chair okay. on the department. Can I continue? Yes, yes. Okay, chair. The possible discontinuing of the law enforcement advancement plan project due to lack of funding commitment in the outer years. Chair, what I want to know is that what is the likelihood of the LEAP project being discontinued in the near future? What is the sustainability of this project? And in the event that it is discontinued, what will happen to these officers that we have trained and invested so much on to ensure safety in our communities? That's my question, Chair. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have responses from the department and thereafter on the entity. If Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Just in terms of the initial questions on the three open cases for fraud and losses, those cases were reported in December and January and were still under investigation. Uh, then in terms of the training, um, there are some reasons, um, some of them being that uh, training was already attended to and received, um, that we have now made it compulsory. Um, for um, some of the training interventions to be attended to by all staff members, and we report on that on a quarterly basis. And then also the COVID pandemic ha did have an impact on the attendance of uh, the training. Do you want me to present the liquor or you want to? No, I can, I can jump in. Thank you so much. We will also allow for some of the officials that will also be jumping in with regard to some of the specifics. Um, I appreciate the member's question with regard to um, the location of of the liquor authority. Um, there is a sentiment that as a Western Cape government, we've always been innovative. We've always seen what is the need and then obviously then applying our minds in that regard. So in terms of the alcohol harms reduction um, and the work that we do in that particular space, the um, if we consider the white paper, if we consider the economy and the balance between the reduction of alcohol arms and the economy, it is front and center for us, member. It's front and center for us when we consider that there is public interest, that when we engage um, liquor outlets, we are first and foremost fully understanding that on the one hand, these outlets need to be compliant, in them being compliant, their businesses will ultimately be able to thrive. Their businesses will be sustainable because when there is non-compliance and some of those non-compliance has such an effect on communities that it will ultimately then lead to that particular licensee holder, that business not thriving and not ultimately reaching their full potential. So it is an ongoing discussion, and I think um, the CEO, I will also bring the CEO in to speak more um, in that regard. But we have been very clear that uh, in terms of, of how to handle it and the realignment um, and how it is focused on making sure, like I said in my opening remarks, that yes, there's a strong link towards the abuse of alcohol, and when there's non-compliance, we are seeing the crime trend. And we are also asking that whenever a liquor outlet is non-compliant, we will want to do everything in our power to ensure that they become compliant, that we are able to fully implement Section 64. And we want Kondlo for the very first time during the last financial year, Section 64s were able to be implemented. But it was against the background of obtaining compliance. Compliance ultimately leads to communities being in a safer space, but also ensuring that that particular business is able to thrive. On the on the issue with regard to the sustainability uh, of, of, of LEAP officers and that particular program, this has been highlighted as a risk, um, as the explanation under the governance um, under the governance framework of, of page number 92 um, sets that out. I think we have been very clear that it is funding that the Premier and Treasury had to locate in other departments. The Premier is on record to indicate that funding had to be taken from the Department of Health 
from the Department of Education in order to plug a need due to the severe chronic under-resourcing that we have seen in the South African Police Service, which has been confirmed not only in our policing needs and priorities, but also in areas like Kaya with the Kaya Commission of Inquiry. So we do know against that backdrop, we have to be innovative, we have to step up, and that risk is identified because we are proactive essentially. Thank you. If I can just um, add, Chairperson, in terms of the um, the, the liquor amendments, uh, prior to us starting with the liquor amendments and getting approval from Cabinet, there was extensive discussions between um, all the Western Cape government departments, so um, getting in input from the Department of Economic Development and Tourism, um, from finance, and then also from, from the other departments like the Department of Health, etc. And uh, so, uh, and also in terms of the task team that is dealing with the amendments, there are representatives from other departments there. So it was not just the Department of Community Safety driving the, the change and the, and the amendments, but also it was a collective uh, decision in terms of the amendments that we were going to um, put forward. Um, uh, also in terms of LEAP, um, the, it, it was um, registered at a, as a strategic risk for the department prior to the financial year because we did not have um, funding that was allocated and secured for uh, the LEAP project until the 2024-25 year. So on page 92, we indicate that it was removed from the department's uh, risk profile. However, we are um, aware um, that come beyond 20, the 24-25 year, currently there is no funding um, allocation and we're hopeful that the, the program or the uh, will continue. However, the LEAP officers are um, appointed on contract and um, many of them do also get absorbed, get absorbed into the law enforcement component of the city of Cape Town into permanent positions as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I will hand over to the Liquor Authority to answer the rest of the questions. Afternoon, Chair and members, Ronnie King, or Chairman of the Liquor Board. Uh, I, I can respond to the two questions with respect to the two members and the activities. I think, as you will see, Dr. Fritworm's number of meetings attended are pretty commensurate with the number of meetings of other board members because we are spread across the several committees. The reason for his uh, additional expenses is that he resides in George. And therefore, we accommodate his travel and his overnight accommodation to attend to board matters when he comes here, whereas other members of the board are all locally based. And that is, it's those costs that push up that thing. So it's not a workload issue. It's actually a physical location linked expenditure. In terms of Ms. Uh, Crystal uh, uh, Abdul, uh, she only joined on the 22nd of the 3rd. Uh, 2022, so she's a new member of the board with appreciation to the Standing Committee for filling that vacancy. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Abdul has not attended meetings so far. In the year under review, which ended in March, he only oh. joined in March, quite correct. Now, just a follow up before I allow other members to, to make follow up. Now, on firstly, Minister, on the misplacement, so to say for the lack of a better word, misplacement of the liquor authority to the department, doesn't that stifle maybe its activity? Because Liquor is an industry. It's an industry on its own, and you know how people during the even the lockdown, if there was one thing you wouldn't want to touch them was on liquor. So that on its own is an industry that is booming, and now you've put it with a security kind of a cluster department. And now, uh, don't you think maybe it it's doesn't it does it not stifle? the growth of the industry because people are knowing that look uh, we are under this even the people that are license holders they don't uh, they know that uh, they are not 
maybe watched in a bad way, but they know that they don't don't do it. I just want to check: is it not real? Don't you think it's stifled the growth of the industry? That's one area I just wanted to follow up on. The second one is uh, on the leap, and I think the leap officers are they not part of the one billion safety plan? Are they not part of that? Now, uh, and is now the one billion rent set only up until the the 2024, 2025, or so it's ending then. So it's not a continuous thing. Okay, no, no, no. Then it answer my question if it ends then. I was just concerned about that. I see Honorable Ngondo want to make a follow up. Also, Honorable Fanny Vestazen. No, thank you, Chair. I also want to make a follow up uh, on the on the on the responses. Firstly, in the amendment process uh, that HOD has just alluded and the involvement of the different uh, departments. I'll be interested to know and if the department can provide evidence of the um, inputs of the liquor traders themselves and particularly those that are operating in the informal space like townships in particular. And 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 in linked to that, I know there's um, a couple of years ago before the amendment process started, um, there was a memorandum handed uh, for this particular purpose by the Liquor Traders Association and the extent to which such was integrated and the issues that they have raised. So I will be I will be interested in that. Because, Minister, for me, one of the things I would want to understand is whether the notion of non-compliance, where exactly from your point as the department, you have actually picked up uh, the areas where there's non-compliance and what's the cause uh, of that uh, non-compliance? And um, have you indeed, um, um, can you share with us, you know, some of your scientific data that actually demonstrate the correlation between uh, those areas in terms of non-compliance and crime reduction either way you know where such a compliance if you take your approach has actually increased um or has actually decreased uh, a crime uh, in 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 those spaces so for me i think uh, thanks for the for the responses and the fact that this is happening but i would really would like because i wouldn't want us to sort of um divert the conversation around this point but i think it's a it's a very critical point given uh, that uh, at point at times you know those that are in those spaces and i'm raising it because even with the Department of Economic Development, I think one of the biggest challenges we have currently is the lack of um, informal economy strategy that actually enables some of the bylaws, you know, to be responsive to the kind of environment that is in the townships so that as you ask compliance and you expect it through law enforcement, you know, you've got enabling uh, bylaws and also the red tape uh, that uh, particularly uh, enterprises that are operating in those spaces, you know, that they have to go through. You understand that and the relationship through which, you know, that uh, notion of compliance can be achieved. Um, so I just wanted to to, to understand uh, uh, those in terms of my 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 my, my follow up and and thanks for the answers. I think on the on the number of uh, 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 meetings. My one, la one, my one last question to this uh, particular department, um, I would like to understand in terms of your policies um, as, as, as this, this department, I think it's a question that I've been asking almost all the other departments is whether you do have a sexual harassment policy. Are women safe in your department? Yes. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the, uh, the responses to my earlier questions. See, I do pick up from the annual report of the department in, in Section C when it comes to government governance that the department feels that it needs to strengthen its oversight over the liquor authority. Now, I would have thought that the first body of oversight over the liquor authority is its own council. So do we now have, you know, a department that wants to have oversight over a council 
of, of another entity. And then you say you've also signed a memorandum of agreement with that entity or you are in the process uh, of signing such a memorandum of agreement. Perhaps if you could just uh, clarify that, because it's, it, for me, it's uh, it's a potentially uh, conflicting situation where where there is a board that's supposed to be relatively independent and be governed only by the legislation. But now there's another entity, a state department, that now wants to have oversight over people with a, a fair amount of independence. So perhaps if you could just uh, ex explain that to me. And then, Chair, uh, I think we were all struck in this year by the tragedy there at the Enubeni Tavern in the, in the Eastern Cape. Um, and my question is just, do we have any, uh, uh, I, I fear to use the word, uh, or I'm reluctant to use the word control, but do we, do we have the capacity to ensure the safety of people that, 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 that use such a places or visit such places? Uh, and and uh, I noticed that to this very day, you know, there's been a lot of rumors as to the actual cause of death there, whether it was, you know, uh, a spiked drinks, uh, whether it might have been, you know, the fumes from a generator and so on. But it, it, it does seem to me that whichever of those the real cause might be, that there's a particular responsibility on the liquor board to, to, to uh, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, uh, ensure that such... such uh, situations will not play out in the Western Cape, or am I completely off track? Do the liquor board see its role as 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 being one that would uh, involve the safety of 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 uh, the people visiting and and uh, people buying from such uh, uh, liquor outlets? Thank you. Honorable Pant or Honorable Postman. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, something that the uh, Minister and the HOD um, uh, referred to in the earlier part of the meeting um, struck me, and I think we would need some more information on it. The department indicated that it could have met 100% of its target if it wasn't for the failure of the National Treasury to implement the preferential procurement um, framework correctly, and that the constitutional court case um, stating that the uh, preferential procurement framework, um, specifically the section on localization, was illegal and invalid, and that had an impact on the department not um, meeting its target. And I just wanted to check if the Auditor General's team is still in the meeting whether the AG can perhaps expand a bit more on um, whether that has had an impact at other departments and other public entities, uh, to what extent is it uh, widespread, and also whether there are any um, remedial remedies besides the remedies already put in place by this department, um, as explained earlier by the CFO. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Mark Hambamboja. Honorable Makamba. She's saying that she's sending a message, questions on the chat, but we can't see them. But it's fine. If she comes, uh, we will uh, allow those questions. Uh, Minister. Thank you so much, Chairperson. I am going to. Um, give over to the HOD, but also to the CEO of the Western Cape um, Liquor Authority. I just want to clarify again, I do not at this point in any way feel that the Liquor Authority is misplaced. I do see that when there is compliance, our communities are safer. And I do want to again state that in our recent um, in our recent engagement with the Liquor Authority, and I think colleagues will be able to appreciate the one factor is that of the 8,898 licensed outlets in our province, 116 did not get automatic renewals. 116. 
of the 116, 91%, and that figure might be higher now, but 91% actually complied by providing the relevant information and then um, engaging the liquor authority. So liquor outlets are wanting to engage. They are wanting to be um, compliant because the clear link between compliance and ensuring that the public interest is taken into account because then businesses are growing. So essentially, it's not a law enforcement or policing of these businesses. We are looking at the safety aspects. There's compliance. I think no member, no citizen would ever want any liquor outlet to sell alcohol to a minor or to sell alcohol to someone that is visibly unable to take a further drop of, of alcohol. So it's in that regard that business owners are largely license holders, largely stepping up to the plate by being compliant because it is in the interest of their own businesses growing essentially. But the CEO is far more articulate um, than what I can ever be, um, and he would be able to then um, sum up that entire thing. I'm not even sure, members, because we we love open engagement. The one thing is that, and I don't even want to put the CEO under pressure, but if we consider the contribution that liquor makes to the GDP, there's other questions that we need to also consider that the impact of alcohol that it has on our society, that if they contribute 3% to the GDP or whatever percent, that's a business, it's helping the GDP. But then to the, to the same extent, we would have to ask the industry that is the social arms also 3%. And it's serious engagements that we are wanting to have. We are wanting to seriously engage liquor outlets. The spread of the 116 that were non-compliant was actually a spread across the entire province. Out of the 116, um, CEO, I'm thinking it's less than 20 was in the Kaya Licha area. But it was a spread from here to George, to Swellendam, to Mosul Bay. So it was a spread of non-compliance in terms of the 116 out of close to 9,000. So it wasn't, there was never any sentiment that it's one particular area where we have been wanting that area to just be compliant for the sake of compliance and for the sake of policing. It's to ensure that businesses are able to thrive. Uh, but the HOD and the CEO is so much more eloquent than, than what I am. Thank, thank you, Minister. So just in, uh, in terms of the question on um, the um, amendments or the proposed amendments, so the white paper um, on alcohol harms reduction was adopted in 2017 and therefore the shift of the Liquor Authority uh, to the Department of Co uh, Community Safety and uh, the requisite alignment. Um, in terms of the amendments, the first set of amendments focused on the greater efficiency of the Liquor Authority, which uh, would obviously support uh, the industry. And in the second set um, that we are busy with the regulatory uh, impact assessment uh, process is dealing with minimum unit pricing and trading hours. Um, that being said, we are still busy with that. So we have not had the public participation processes as yet. So there will be um, input from uh, the Liquor Traders Association, et cetera, um, in that regard. And the, the overall aim is to assist the industry to thrive, but then also to ensure the reduction of harms as it relates to, to alcohol. Um, in terms of the sexual harassment policy, um, there is a transversal policy that the department has adopted and does implement. Um, in terms of the question on, on governance, the minister does have a responsibility um, in terms of governance uh, in relation to the liquor authority. And uh, so the uh, memorandum of understanding is not a top-down approach, but rather just to clarify our roles and responsibilities and also to indicate the high levels of cooperation between the entity and, and the department. So it's more a memorandum of cooperation between the two um, rather than um, just solely oversight and, and a top-down approach. Um, I'll hand over to the CEO. I'm just checking if I have anything else here. Okay, um, the, the last, um, sorry, and, and uh, perhaps the CFO will come in again. 
is in relation to the uh, target, and that was uh, by Honorable Member Bosman, that we did not achieve one of our indicators. Uh, we had 45 indicators, we achieved 44, and the one indicator that we did not achieve was as a result of not being able to procure the services of a um, service provider timely. And um, initially we did advertise, there was no response. And then eventually when we did have a uh, bidder um, who did bid, uh, we uh, were confronted with the um, constitutional court judgment and the communique from um, National Treasury indicating that we could not continue with the procurement, but the AG is also in the room. Um, I know Member Bosman asked um, the AG to give feedback in that regard as well. So, Chair, if you'd allow me to hand over to the Liquor Authority and then um, if the AG is going to comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will try and be as brief as possible. Um, uh, just simply to say the following as far as regulation is concerned. I think the one thing we must be mindful of is that um, alcohol as a definition, there's a definition as that is world widely understood now. Uh, it is a, a substance that uh, produces dependence. It is a substance that uh, forms the basis of social ills and regulation. You're not going to escape. Nowhere in the world you escape regulation. It is simply a matter of fact. Uh, when it comes to our conducting business and so forth, our constitution essentially is also very clear what our responsibilities are in relation to this. Uh, Chair, I speak to this just simply because this is a debate that comes up repeatedly. And I think uh, what I'm trying to instill in the way, what we are trying to instill in the Western Cape Legal Authority is that we are unapologetic about regulation. I think that's in first and foremost. However, the way in which we do and conduct the regulation is to have maximum impact with an understanding that you can have the license, provided you practice and trade in a manner that respects public interest. Now, this is the only thing that we are all about, is actually understanding that determination of that public interest, that that is done in a way that it actually exemplifies what the public interest is. And secondly, in that continuum, which is the relationship we want to have with the license holder, that it continues in a way that they respect in the way in which they conduct their license and their business, public interest. So if that is done, then I think we satisfy both uh, the, the safety aspects and elements that we'd like to support, but also importantly, that good business makes sense by complying. So if you're compliant in that space, you can tolerate it. And I think that is essentially what we'd like. If you had to ask the public, essentially, to what extent they support a license, invariably don't find many support for it. However, we do find that in some instances, you would find the public interest best served. Like we are keen to ensure that if you're going to have an outlet because of the supply, uh, the uh, demand for that, then it could potentially, we have to explore the possibility that the license be granted for regulatory purposes. So we're also mindful of, of, of that, because once you have regulation, you can minimize the hours of trade and, and, and so forth. So the issue around uh, the, 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 the demand or see the, 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 how, do, how do you propagate uh, uh, the economy vis-a-vis -vis the, um, uh, the need to be safe? and our spaces to be safe. Now, let's use this a perfect example. So you have a demand that within the CBD, you want trading up until 13, 14, uh, well, sorry, I'm taking it to the afternoon. Actually, you look until up to three o'clock, four o'clock in the, in the morning. But with that comes a, a very definite risk. And that is with that kind of access and availability of liquor, you're invariably going to find that if 50% of trauma is occasioned by liquor, during those hours, it's in beyond 50%. The rest of the day may be lingering around 30-20%, but that time of the night, the ratio is probably around 80 to 90%, because car accidents, stabbings, trauma, all of that will be occasioned invariably by the availability and access to liquor. So, Chairperson, the safety lens is a considerable lens. And I just wanted to remind us that in terms of the Constitution, you know, what we want is a society based on democratic values where people essentially experience social justice and also that uh, open democratic society. So the, 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 what we're trying to install is we want communities well expressed. And regulation in their spaces, we would like them to own their spaces and to contribute to their own safety.
Chairperson, that is just uh, in relation to that. May can I also say how resilient the industry is? Because I think we're not often mindful of that. The business, the, that particular sector within the pandemic was the best faring se sector. And I think that was uh, that was acknowledged uh, by previous uh, speakers here. It's resilient and it's elastic. There's always a demand for it, no matter what. However, we do also understand when we required beds, the lockdown made the beds available. If you just flip that in your mind to see the number of beds that became available because of the absence of trauma, that is the reality that one France and it allows us an opportunity to demonstrate how much more we can do for our, our, our communities. But let me also say, we're mindful that we need to be efficient, we also mindful that we need to become uh, reduce red tape invol involved with our processes. So we've collaborated even with DDAT to ensure that our online platforms and all these are developed to facilitate a business. So we are mindful that uh, that we're not contrary uh, to becoming more efficient, but that we actually uh, accommodate. But also more importantly, buy into the notion that we have to be. Uh, uh, business friendly. Thank you. Oh yes, and there was a yeah, there was a question about Enyo Benny. Yeah, yes. Um, I was um, the Western Cape Liquor Authority was approached by a number of of, of people to, to 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 give comment around the uh, chairperson. Now we can you know we can do a lot of things. Blame the parents that allow their kids to go there. We can blame this and that. But ultimately, communities must be empowered to understand that these outlets exist because they allow them. So we must become the, the we must understand that our service delivery model must entail being responsive to communities because if they identified the question that i would ask if that outlet was identified previously and reported to us then i believe as an as the authority we failed to respond to it appropriately and now we must demonstrate what we have done provided that has come to our notice either in terms of reports but more importantly, if we have routine inspections and we find that, then we're entitled to close uh, close those premises. So, Chairperson, yes, uh, we will. Have, we have a number of incidents, uh, various incidents, of course. You are aware that the shooting incidents were the ones that were apparent in the Western Cape, where uh, you know, a number of people were killed uh, as a result of uh, uh, gang activity or just violence uh, attacking some of the outlets uh, and and the shooting incidents that spread from there. Of course, we respond to that. Uh, in a way that is very dramatic, we close down the those those uh, enterprises uh, and um, uh, conduct hearings to ensure whether they have the necessary things in place to continue doing business. Chairperson, I thank you. Questions that have been posed by Honorable Makamba Poja. And he, she is online, but she says she's battling to get to pay to make questions. He say, she says on page 91, please explain the function of the area based teams and why only 16 teams were established across the province. On page 92, what are there is policing needs that the department has identified. If addressed, how will they assist in combating crime? Am I too fast? Then on page 93, the department, it says that it has moved from compliance only oversight to outcome-based oversight. They've moved from compliance only oversight to outcome-based oversight. Please explain the difference in the in and impact the department seek to achieve. On page 95, please explain the nature of the cases that were open and why were they closed. I think that one was handled. Page 99, I'm concerned about the low number of people who attended training provided under provincial forensic services. They attend this was very low. Also, please explain why more people attended. Why more people attended the PB 
triple PE grant training? Or what is it about? Honorable Ngondo? No, Chair, maybe I'll, 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 I'll put it in writing because I would like to maybe get uh, from the LICA authority and the department uh, the extent if they have done um, of the increased compliance, uh, which I think Minister has explained uh, so well in terms of the numbers of the complying um, uh, operators. And I think my question was the correlation between that and crime reduction. So maybe if they can just provide me, if they do have, they can even send it uh, uh, anytime if they've done any of such studies that at least are able to give us that comfort that the more you have complying uh, sort of uh, operators, um, you know, we are seeing uh, an improvement uh, in terms of uh, uh, crime reduction, if there's any relationship between the two. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much. Uh, HOD Minister, will you respond on the questions? Thank you so much for, for the questions. I will just touch on the one and then I will hand over. Um, Member Makamba Pocha, in terms of the policing needs and priorities, as it is elaborated on page number 92, is that the provincial executive will ultimately determine the policing needs and priorities. It is, um, it is highlighted as a limited ability of the department to influence the allocation of the policing needs and priorities in the Western Cape, ultimately because choices are still made in Pretoria, where we don't have direct management of the South African Police Service. However, the Constitution does allow for oversight. We have expanded that. We are doing our utmost to ensure that we are holding SAPs accountable and by holding SAPs accountable, we are ultimately strengthening their hand by making sure that SAPs resources or um, um, under resourcing is attended to, etc. But the policing needs and priorities is a constitutionally legislated mandated process that we must undertake. We take that year on year. We submit to the president. We submit it to the National Minister of Police. And as of yesterday, after requesting feedback from the office of the premier, the premier during the last quarters, um, Lechotla, provided the president and the national minister with a copy of our policing needs and priorities. And we have asked for an update on the implementation of the policing needs and priorities. And as I've stated, as of yesterday, that reply has not been forthcoming. Uh, Chairperson, I also realized that the AG did not uh, have the opportunity to answer the previous um, uh, question, but if I can just answer and then maybe hand over. In terms of the area-based teams, the area-based teams have been established in the areas with the highest rate of murder, which are within the city of Cape Town Metropole. Uh, this is in line with the Western Cape um, Provincial Safety Plan. So uh, that's why there are currently 16 areas. 11 areas are within the city of Cape Town Metropole and then five areas within the five uh, district municipalities uh, across the province. Um, in terms of the compliance only and then outcome based oversight, we don't want to just in terms of our oversight go uh, to SAPs, conduct inspections at police stations, but not actively engage uh, in terms of improving um, and, and ensuring that some of our recommendations and findings are getting the necessary attention it deserves so that there are, is better service delivery to the citizens um, by the SAP. So we'd like to think that we're co-producing with the SAPs in many instances as opposed to just monitoring um, and providing um, inspection reports. In terms of the nature of, of the case, it was a fraud matter and it was... Um, a matter that was identified by the AG in terms of cover quoting. We then referred the matter to uh, the Provincial Forensic Services for an investigation, and um, we have taken a decision um, as a department uh, not to procure any services uh, from those uh, two companies. Um, Chair, with your 
permission, I can hand over to the AG to answer Member Bossman's question. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, the question I'm responding to is whether the all departments were impacted by the decision of the Constitutional Court. The decision was made by the Constitutional Court and subsequently the interpretation was corrected. And particularly in the Western Cape, we also sent communication to the head of departments in relation to where Auditor General is in terms of the interpretation and how the matter is going to be approached. And for from our purposes, for our purposes, we're not aware of any department that is dealing with the matter differently from the communication and uh, and our letters of communication. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Apology, Chair. Um, I did not answer one of the questions, and it was in relation to the training. The triple B um, e -E -T, um, in that was identified as um, on our fraud risk register, and therefore the the training has been um, undertaken. Undertaken, and I did indicate earlier the you know the in terms of the low numbers, but we have also made it compulsory now for all staff to attend the training. Thank you. Thank you. Honourable members, I want us to move to section E. Of board reports and those who want to ask question can Chairperson? Why? Online? Uh, yes, Chairperson, uh, Gillian Postman here. Yes, yes, Honourable Postman. I just have a follow up with regards to the response from the AG to my question. May I ask that follow up now? Okay, no, do that before we go to E. Thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Chair, I'm, I'm not uh, privy to the contents of the circular that the AG sent on the impact of the Constitutional Court judgment, um, but what I asked specifically was around whether it is correct to assume that if it wasn't for that judgment and for the, the way the judgment was handled within Treasury, the department would have received um, would have met 100% of its targets. That's what I'm trying to understand, Chairperson. So if the AG can give me a yes or a no on that, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much, Honourable Chair. Chasing 100%. I, I think, uh, Honourable Chair, it's a challenging question in that uh, for AG, it would be difficult to determine that uh, when a department has decided how it's going to deal with the with the planned targets to determine whether the planned targets is going to be influenced or not influenced by a decision that is made because any decision that involves performance against the target is going to be driven by a number of factors because while you discover that you're not going to meet a target, you establish mechanism to go around, and those will, de will depend on various limitations, and they may vary from one department to the other. And it makes it difficult for Auditor General to be able to, to determine that uh, the consequence of not achieving a target in, in a particular situation is as a result of this factor and not the other factor. We, we therefore could not pronounce on that area whether it was because of the of the of the constitutional uh, court or not. Chair. I hope I'm covering the question. Chair. Thank you, AG. Thank you, Honourable Passman, uh, Passman, for the question. Uh, Honourable Van der Vestesen on E, and followed by Honourable Gondo on E. Yes, thank you, Chair. There are a number of questions that I have uh, uh, for the Liquor Authority. Perhaps if you could just tell us what is the latest in terms of the Sunbell building. I uh, see this reference that it didn't comply with the health and safety regulations, that it was put to auction, and that there may have been a problem with the, with the lease of, of, of that building. The second one for me is in terms of uh, fines, 
you blame fines for the fact that there was a complete under uh, under uh, uh, loss of income, under collected income. Uh, yet it seems to me as if there wasn't that much of a deviation from the 2021 to 2022 financial year. Perhaps if you could just help us, because the, all in all, your underspending seems to be in the order of 23%. Yet fines, if I do my calculation, only differed by about 6%. So why are you are you highlighting fines then as one of the, the causes for 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 also your, your difference there and and then you say that um i see also that quite quite a uh, uh, significant percentage of your fines have been outstanding for a year what are your chances of collecting uh fines after more than 365 days and perhaps the auditor general could also come in here because i i i think in terms of accountancy standards uh, I would love to know how much of those fines have been written off and why are you still showing them, you know, because in a sense, I don't think that is uh, an accurate then reflection of your of your financial position. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair, for now that that would be all. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Honorable Ngon. Thank you, Chair. Given the record Given the record of clean audits uh, by this department, and I think the HOD alluded to the notion of um, clean audits and service delivery, I do you think as a department, uh, if I think AG, um, I think as the process is actually around the corner, uh, to start uh, auditing this department of community safety on service delivery, do you think uh, you, you would be comfortable uh, sailing through to also get um, a sort of a clean uh, clean bill of health in as far as service delivery is concerned. Uh, just want to check uh, uh, that uh, from yourself. Two, I think a standard question given the discussion we earlier on had with the Department of Premier as it relates to the, um, the CSC uh, that is with them, is issues of staff overpayments in this particular department and what would be the nature of those um, and uh, the kind of um, uh, 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 challenges that you're grappling with. Uh, I think we listened to other departments explaining their own peculiar circumstances when it comes to the issue of staff overpayments. And in page 170, I think on my electronic one, it's 179, but I see it's 177. I think on the underspending, my 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 question is around um, the COE, which is attributed to lead time in filling of post and attrition rate in the department. Maybe you can share more. Uh, what what uh, are the causes uh, of delays in filling? posts and their impact once again to service delivery um, of this department. And, and, and also one question um, at this point, um, 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 Minister and HOD, is that I think post-COVID, one of the things also we're dealing with is that on one hand, I think as a provincial government and national, of course, you know, the notion of trying to streamline and cut the fat in as far as COE is concerned has been something that uh, I think uh, we believe is the way to go. But um, we've seen during the COVID uh, how uh, interfacing departments like yours have got a pressure uh, from a service delivery point of view where people, you know, are demanding services and you actually have to go an extra mile and that puts a workload um, uh, to the personnel that you have. So how are we balancing this? Because this continues to be, I think, a challenge. On one hand, we are trying to manage the COE budget, but there is increasing demand uh, for public services um, and uh, if, 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 if we all think about it. And obviously, Minister, I'm sure you would have argued uh, in the House 
also about um, in migration to this province, which relates to population growth, and I'm sure your colleagues even before you would have argued that, um, that uh, in migration, and I'm sure your services uh, would have felt that. So how are we dealing with this uh, with this with this balance because i saw i think in one of the in one of the sections here you you talk about the issue of organogram um, which i would believe has got also everything to do with how the pressures to human resources that you have in the department they have to deal with so that's um that's uh, another issue i just wanted to 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 understand and then on the understanding on transfers you say it's due to less funds paid to municipalities. Maybe you can just explain to me what does it mean? Uh, less funds, is it because there's less uh, funding towards municipalities and what kind of programs are you referring to uh, in that regard? That will be that for now, Chair. Thank you. Honorable Postman. Thank you very much, Chairperson Chair. I want to ask a follow-up on the response from the AG, as well as a, um, a touch a new question to uh, Member Nkondlo's input. The, the follow-up, firstly, the AG has now indicated that the, the responsibility is on the department to adjust its targets um, if um, there are factors that are going to negatively um, impact its ability to meet that target. So I'd like to understand from an oversight perspective, how do we change the way we um, sort of oversee the department um, to make provision for things such as a national treasury regulation um, instructing government departments to um, stop procurement? Because in a normal corporate um, environment and in the legal fraternity, something like that would be considered force majeure. And there's a legal process to deal with that. But um, I'd like to understand how we look at it from a government perspective where a provincial government department is not able to spend money because the nature of our um, operating system in South Africa is that we are interdependent and interconnected to both um, national and local government. So that's the first follow up to the AG. And then the second follow up, and I think it's also for the AG, Member Nkondlo referred to um, the AG's um, plan to now also start conducting qualitative service delivery audits as well. And I'd like the AG to maybe expand a little bit more to the response to um, what Member Nkondlo is getting. How would a department like community safety um, be assessed in that sense? Because the majority of the, the bulk of what this department does is oversight over another department, which is a national department. So it's not sort of in the pure sense of the term, a public facing citizen um, engaged service delivery department. Thank you, Chairperson. Thanks very much, Honorable uh, Postman. Yes, uh, please, uh, uh, Department. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chairperson. I will merely touch one particular question, and I do appreciate the question from Member Kondlo. When I stepped into office, I wanted to make it extremely clear that we need to ensure that vacancies that are in the department should be filled. As things stand, we have a 3.1% vacancy rate. It's within an accepted bracket, but I'm still not entirely satisfied because we have been refocusing, realigning our energies and what we are doing. And Mimon Kondlo, there's two people in this room that I've literally not had to chase away, but I've had to tell them that they actually need to take their leave. So we are fully aware that the service delivery pressures on us as a department is so huge and we are stepping up. We are getting into spaces that for a large extent hasn't always happened. So in terms of all the programs, it's only 3.1%. By next year, when it is my full year of, of that's if I'm still here, 
if if I should be accounting for it. For a spot, if I should be accounting for a specific, I would like to see that number being reduced, because because we see that if any program and if there is pressures on a program, we had one person. I'm not going to look at that person. We had a, a particular strat session. The person was on leave, and he or she literally came in for two days. So we have dedicated officials. We are in the of wanting to service our communities. Um, so the 3.1% and getting the trimming the fat, I fully understand. I would want to make sure that our fixed establishment on what we have should be ideally filled. Um, if I must say 2% and you are only accountable to 2%, uh, but you will probably say at 1% because we are doing so much in our oversight, monitoring, evaluation, but more so, in terms of the work that we do in the districts and in the municipalities and with the city of Cape Town. Um, HOD, I will note you and then if you bring any colleague in. Thank you, Minister. Just in terms of the question on um, service delivery and an audit, well, our performance information has been audited and was unqualified, so uh, that is a possibility. Uh, we, um, in terms of staff overpayments, there were two staff members in the uh, ministry. Um, and uh, we have um, then requested a response from them in that regard, which we are considering now. And then there was also overpayments made to all the SMS, and I trust myself and all the colleagues have, have paid back um, that uh, that was a mistake. And the CFO is confirming where we all um, uh, had to um, then have that deducted, which was uh, done. Um, in terms of our cost employment and uh, cost of employment, and as Minister is saying, it would really be good to to have all our posts filled. But um, we were undertaking a realignment and repurposing exercise in the department that is going to lead uh, to a structural change. So we've been very careful in terms of our appointments and to make uh, suitable uh, appointments at that. So it has taken longer. The shortlisting process at times um, is quite uh, also cumbersome because uh, we have to do it amongst our other tasks and find time to, uh, to do that as well. In terms of less funds paid to the municipalities, um, we, um, in terms, they have been in the past um, rollover request as well because of there not being an alignment between our financial year and the financial year of municipalities. So at times, um, all funds have not been uh, spent as, as planned. And um, we have, an, at times as well, uh, not paid out the, uh, the full amounts because we want the municipalities to pay, uh, to first um, spend the funds of the previous year. Thank you. I'm not sure if anyone wants to add, even if I've covered all the questions. Chairperson, yeah, thank you very much. I will respond to the issue around the building itself, and then with regard to the fines, I'll request uh, Sandiso to respond to that specifically. Uh, the building that we are currently housed in has been a problematic one uh, for a very for, for various reasons, but uh, primarily because we had an absent landlord. The landlord was uh, already living is already living abroad, and that he provided the maintenance of the building or the management of the building uh, to a lease uh, a company uh, and the liaison or the conduct or the communication between the landlord and the, the managers on this uh, was not ideal. Uh, it was um, it was so problematic that a lot of these matters had to enter our risk register in terms of uh, maybe even completing uh, our our tenure. Uh, the remaining uh, five-year tenure at, uh, in the building. We are now very close to two and a half, I think, uh, where we are at now. Um, um, gladly, we can report at this point that the building was sold about four months ago, um, and the new landlords are, have been there since the day they bought the property. So what you immediately found, and maybe I should just say the following, uh, there were fire inspections uh, conducted as a result of... Um, uh, uh, complaints uh, that were lodged. Uh, when we had architects in the building, they indicated immediately there were problems in terms of the building. We've commissioned a conditional report 
on the building uh, that is normally done in terms of all public buildings uh, and that was now fast, uh, finalized most recently. We can now comfortably say that it's on all probability uh, the old risk has been mitigated. The matters that are, are currently considered are not insurmountable. We believe we will finish our, uh, the, the, the remaining tenure in that uh, um, uh, the remaining part of of our lease in that in that particular building, it has also allowed us now to to do some of the things that we wanted to do uh, in relation to the office space as well. So we we're glad that matter has come to a close. Uh, so this we're going to touch on the fines. Uh, th th thank you, Chair. Just to respond on the fines, once the LLT has concluded that there's a transgression and that transgression is serious enough but they give a chance to the license holder to continue holding the license. They decide that the appropriate remedy is not revocation of the license, but a fine, but a serious yeah. fine. But because the intent is not to kill off the business, but is to, is, to, is to correct the conduct, they allow for time for that business to pay the license, the, the fine. So what you normally find is that the payment period for fines is three to six months. To say, we'll give you a high enough fine so that you don't repeat the transgression, but will provide you a period on which you pay that fine because we've decided you you shall retain the, 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 the license. So what normally happens is that you then have a few businesses coming back to say, look, my conduct has been corrected. Whatever resulted in the non-compliance I've remedied from a management point of view. If I had to appoint more security guards to check the age of the um, Patreons, I'm doing that but that required an investment. I can't get to the fine because I had to first invest money. So they normally ask for an extension in terms of the payment period, which is why we see fines then going into the 365 days. However, in circumstances where we find that the non-payment of the fine is willful disregard of orders of the LLT, what normally happens is that we suspend that, um, that license in collaboration with SEBS and they are very diligent. They will make sure that on busy days that business is closed. And what we normally see is that is an immediate payment. So even though the payment period appears to be long, um, once the regulatory mechanisms kick in and someone is not able to pay to, to trade on a busy weekend, the same person who's been saying they don't have money, one, one person paid 320,000 rand on one day after coming to our offices pleading that they don't have money. So we're starting to see that the additional capacity we have, the effectiveness of the, of, of the enforcement is improving and it does result in, in, in payment. However, fines are not a, a measure of um, revenue generation. They're a measure to correct conduct. So we don't manage them in a manner that destroys business. We manage them in a manner that rehabilit rehabilitates non-compliant non businesses. I want to go then to the um, second question, which is linked to that. So the, the fines are recoverable. For as long as the license is valid and it's being traded upon, the fine is recoverable. Even in instances whereby the, 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 the license had dies, either the person doesn't pay the license, the fine is recoverable because what we're trying to, what we're seeing now is that someone has got a 300,000 rand fine. Then they decide maybe I must let that license lapse. I must go and, and, and apply for a new one. The previous fine follows the license holder. The mere non-existence of that specific fine number or, or of that license number does not absolve the license holder of the responsibility relating to their conduct. So the recovery of the fines at this stage is not in, is, is, is not in doubt, but we do uh, what we call impair them to indicate that, they, that, that there's some level of doubt. And then the, the second question was around the reasons uh, provided on page 123. Those reasons are merely explaining the movement in, in revenue. The, the reasons that explain the non-spending or the underspending are contained from co compensation of employee goods and services and payment uh, for capital assets. So the, the two are not related. So the, the explanation on, 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 on fines in that page is not meant to explain the, the underspending. The underspending is explained by the headings I've just mentioned. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I think the, the part on the fines, it's, it's covered, except maybe to emphasize that sometimes the, the impairment is seen to be a write-off, but it, it should be understood that the, the impairment is just to best 
reflect the fair market value of the of the data at that point in time. However, there is still a legal obligation to collect the amount that is owing. Uh, moving over to the follow-up question uh, relating to to the department's performance, uh, Chair, I think th- this question cannot best be answered by Auditor General, in the sense that uh, we we we're not the party that changes the, the 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 targets or that changes the the rules of the of the. The, the regulations, and therefore we 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 don't have terms of reference in this regard. Uh, I would request uh, to 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 stay away from this question. <laughs> Is it not uh, uh, <laughs> maybe to come to your rescue? Is it not related to the? Is it not related to the question you normally ask as members of performance audit? Is it not? Which which question, Chair? If if the question, Chair, is saying... I mean, the, the question from Honorable Part Postman, are you answering the question from Honorable Postman? Because he was asking whether, based on the question that was asked by Honorable Ngon, is it possible to implement what Honorable Ngondlo has asked on the department because of the nature that the service the department is rendering? Oh, okay. No, no. So I was just ahead of myself. Then apologies. Thanks, Chair. I think when it comes to the work on on service delivery. Uh, what we do, we've got a team that specifically look at this engagement. We refer to them as performance audit in themselves. They they vary. Normally, when we do the audit, sometimes we do a a a, a value add by bringing those teams to to put a flavour into our normal audit. That is the benefit sometimes the departments and entities get. But there are instances where we request the performance team to specifically look at the performance audit. In that regard, we, we sit and engage with the department and understand the strategies of the department, how they go about performing the work. And then we go and look at the regulation and the, uh, re- and the design of the entire an entire system so that we can be able to cover specific issues relating to um, uh, effectiveness, efficiency, and cost. And and that, in a sense, uh, brings that service delivery and whether uh, matters uh, services being delivered on time. Thanks, Chair. But we do have a team. If they want to engage on, on service delivery audit, we, we can always, even if they want to decide later, we can always invite the team to come and have a discussion and have a presentation with the department in that regard. Thanks, Chair. We're ready for that. Especially in view of the 14 clean audits you've been having it probably. Now, if uh, I see there's follow-ups before, maybe I do those follow up okay. Is the follow up a new question? Okay, before the new question, just uh, I see on uh, on page two hundred and three, there's uh, on the box there it says no performance awards were made during the year. What might have been the reason for that? Uh, is it because of uh, the below explanation that says the, the the Department of Public Service? Is it because of what is the explanation that has been given there? I just want to check. Mm. Then on page 195, I'm sorry to start from the last page and move back. There's a uh, on the on what. Oh, on the box, they say decrease is due to the reduction of the LIP budget. It's something similar to a question that was asked on on section C. There's quite a that is quite a drastic decrease 
of uh, 195. The LIP budget in 2020-2021 was 417 million. And for 2021-2022, the HSS budget was 165 million. So it's quite a dramatic decrease. So maybe there might be a good explanation for that. Honorable Van Vestesen. Yes, thank you, Chair. Two questions from my side. The, I see there's a reference to an official that uh, called in a company to come and address a damp problem, literal, literal damp, dampness. Now, uh, and that the supply chain management process weren't followed. Now, uh, I, I have great respect for the fact that in a relatively small entity like the Liquor Authority, uh, to have your supply chain management processes and so on is not always that that easy, as as for example in in huge uh, uh, public entities or uh, provincial departments etc. Now, perhaps if you could just help because my impression is here you come in in the morning you see there's been some flooding due to a bathroom tap or something, and 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 you want to avoid further damage and uh, you know caused by this dampness. And now you call in, you know, somebody very quickly to come and assist. Uh, so while you may not have followed the supply chain management processes, you 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 perhaps assisted in um, in avoiding further costs for the entity. So uh, and and my impression is that there is provision for emergency procurement, etc. So why was this eventually necessary to to still uh, investigate? Uh, could it not have been condoned by by making use of emergency procurement regulations, etc.? Et so that's that's my one question, Chair. And the last one is on the very last page of the annual report for, of the department. There, where you say irregular expenditure uh, next year to the annual financial statements, there are a number of amounts mentioned. Now, my impression is that uh, the, some of those may be repetitive amounts. That uh, you know, we one shouldn't uh, add them all together, but 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 perhaps you can just help me to understand why can uh, such an amount be simultaneously as on the 31st of March uh, on the stage two and the stage three in terms of the uh, in, in, in terms of the uh, treatment uh, of irregular expenditure, and perhaps if you could just help us. Uh, in in terms of understanding uh, that page, uh, the irregular expenditure, the condemnation thereof, disciplinary actions, and and uh, the, some of those amounts or those amounts seem to be fairly significant. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair. One issue as a follow-up from the previous. I just want to check uh, on the staff attrition. In which uh, specific areas in the department or management levels are you sort of experiencing uh, staff attrition and how are you sort of managing that if it is not a, if it is a, a, a big issue for you as the department? And then uh, I think on page um, 196, I see the um, safety ambassadors program is being outsourced to who is it being outsourced to and and why? Why is it being uh, outsourced? Uh, and maybe as part of it, can you indicate how long have you had this uh, safety ambassadors program and any impact assessment that you have done on its, um, you know, subsequent um, value uh, in as far as the as the mandate of the department is concerned and my last one i think on page 198 uh, chair um i think if i'm understanding uh, in the box there under 10.4 um of what um the category of cases that have been written off as per the um, state attorney please Tell me or give me what would have been the circumstances um, of the leave uh, without pay uh, that have uh, accumulated to that particular amount. 
uh, whilst I understood it has been written off, what would have been the circumstances uh, that led to such page 190? It's 198, I think, in your copy. Yeah, because it's 200 on mine, 198, 10.4 under uh, impairment of receivables. Thank you, Chair. Last question from Honorable Makamba Mbojai. She's saying that on page 176, what is concerning me is underspending by the department caused by not filling vacancies posts, for example, in program for Provincial Secretariat for Policing Services and Security Risk Management. Why is the department not filling posts? On page 177, why did the department transfer less funds to municipalities and then come report that they understand because they sent that was not answered yet ne? Yeah, it, okay that was taken care of on page 191 no i think that one she also indicated that it's already been asked about ambassadors project which was asked by honorable bondo and on page 196 that the administration is also the same of ambassadors program with the, that that has also been asked 199, the department surrendered more than 3.6 million intended for compensation of employees. And the last one is earlier, the department mentioned that the premier intends to fight the new pandemic, which is joblessness and hunger. But then here we have a department that takes money, which could have been used to create jobs and salary to revenue funds. Why is that the case? Thanks, department. Jefferson, thank you so much. I will field two of two of the questions, and then I will hand over um, question two o three, page two o three, with regards to the no performance awards um, were made during the year. Um, Members and chairperson, there was a provincial cabinet decision um, that no performance bonuses will be paid for the 2021-2022 um, financial year. Um, obviously, then against final, um, fiscal constraints across our entire country, considering the pressures of COVID-19 as well. Um, then on page 195, um, the decrease is due to the reduction in the LEAP budget, um, 417 million in 2020 2021, um, and then it drops to 165 million for the 21 22 financial year. With a, with a scale up and the rollout of the LEAP program, there's various expenses that you won't incur year on year, for example, in the purchasing of vehicles, equipments, etc. So if you are giving out X amount of capital for those expenses. You are not buying vehicles every year or firearms every year. Um, I will give over to the HOD. Thank you. I can just add on that as well. Um, the city of Cape Town had requested a rollover of the previous year's funding of 184 million, bringing that total to 354 million, and therefore uh, the uh, amount in uh, the last year's budget being reduced. Um, accordingly, um, the city did um, have difficulty in spending uh, the um, initial amount due to the COVID uh, pandemic uh, because of uh, procure, uh, procure reasons of procurement that uh, vehicles could not be procured timely, and also training had to be put on hold because during some stages of the lockdown, um, they could not be in-person uh, training. Um, in terms of the level of um, the critical occ occupation um, or, or the, uh, the attrition rate that is linked to security advisors, um, in uh, that, that level in, in the department. Um, and then um, in terms of the Youth Safety and Ambassador Program, uh, the EPWP payments were outsourced. Um, so because uh, Provincial Treasury had given us a, a large amount to employ or to provide temporary work opportunities uh, to safety ambassadors, we were unable to manage the payment 
uh, in-house because we already had at that time um, carried the administration and the payment of the Chrysalis graduates, and therefore we outsourced the payment. Um, the, we only received um, an allocation to um, uh, to provide work opportunities for safety ambassadors for a period of 12 months. Uh, we did not uh, receive an allocation beyond uh, that period. Um, the leave uh, without pay refers to uh, employees that were in our employ, but then subsequently um, left, and the state uh, attorney's office advised us um, to actually write off um, the, those, um, the, the leave um, because the prospects of... Um, recovering the money was was going to be um, low. I'm not sure if I, I may have missed one question. Um, I think Minister answered that in terms of the performance awards that it was a Western yeah. Cape government the decision. Um, the irregular expenditure. No. I can explain. Okay, CFO will, will answer just in terms of... One, when the CFO answered, uh, just as a follow-up question, if it, you've outsourced the payment not the rendering of the work. Now, to whom was it outsourced to? Is it a private company or the state department? No, it wasn't. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson. Um, through yourself, uh, it, it was initially a private organization, an NGO. Uh, then we had an uh, a, an issue with um, the AG in terms of of the of the classification and and the procurement process that we followed in terms of limited bid, um, and the department then decided it's prudent that we'll not proceed with that uh, with that uh, contract any further. Uh, after it, it lapsed, we then. For six months during this period, then also looked at at, at uh, processing the payments in house. So uh, currently, we've now again engaged a service provider, also an NGO, for for uh, for doing that administration of payments. Yeah. yeah. Just the payment of money that is being outsourced. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the value of the contract is 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 really just. The management fee that they charge us because we had we have the funding of Is of of that. How much money is to handle that? The department uh, cannot. The resources are quite intensive. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> if I can just add, we decided that in instead of all our staff because it was quite a few staff members in in the the operational program as well as in the finance department actually processing those payments because it amounted to like one thousand six hundred payments. We felt that our staff members could be better utilized doing service to actual service delivery than administrate uh, administering payments um, and timesheets and et cetera. You can answer the irregular. Yeah, um, thank you, actually. Uh, just before we go to the irregular on on um, note number 15 was also the issue of underspend, uh, the 8.8 .8 million. And um, that was uh, with uh, look, it's it, it's within the two percent. Uh, Generally accepted norm uh, of PT uh, uh, of of good financial governance within the department, but it's largely attributed to to about six million that was earmarked funding that we couldn't spend on anything else, um, and that's the reason why the amount was uh, was that quantum. Uh, then, just lastly, in terms of the regular expenditure, the amounts uh, so. So if you look at the legend uh, at the bottom of that page on, on 230, you'll see that the total confirmed cases is 14. And then um, just in, in terms of where they are, the status in the process, you'll see that no losses were incurred on all 14. And then the breakup of that 14 is where uh, the investigation is still in progress. And uh, that's seven. And then the last seven that's indicated for the 461,000 is where it has been referred to provincial treasury to the condemnation working committee for, for, um, for condemnation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can this be avoided in future? Said it's just one of those cases where we will always have to go and look for condemnation 
uh, even before we incur the expenditure? Yes. So, so I will take this. So, so we, in terms of the, uh, that uh, large amount of the twenty-five million, it was an extension of a security contract, um, and we extended the contract based on time, which is twelve months, as opposed to fifteen percent, the fifteen percent threshold. Um, there was uh, no. Um, but we had there was value for money. The service provider uh, did provide the service. There was no fraud or corruption. And um, initially, the AG did deem it as irregular. We argued that it was irregular. Um, and uh, eventually, the AG agreed with us as well. We have since um, updated our accounting officer delegation. So it was a, an error of interpretation. Um, and also because our accounting officer delegations had the 12 month period there as well as the 15 percent. So we should have actually had removed the 12 month period from there. We have since updated it. I signed the uh, new AOS uh, by the 30th of September. And we also put a system in place where our internal control unit now would, as soon as we get circulars coming through prov from provincial tre treasury, we'll, we will immediately update uh, the AOS. So that is the large uh, amount. And then also what we've decided to do is that we are doing pre-audits of batches before payments are made. So every payment now goes through uh, internal control checks before the payment is made um, also in that regard. So that is why that is um, that large amount. Chair, and if I can just once again to confirm, when this particular matter played out in the media on the 5th of October, we were also very clear that there was no corruption, there was no fraud, and this is actually a proactive step from the from the department to make sure that it does not happen again. Thank you. Chair, then there was also the, the, the small matter about the uh, flooding. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in, in government, in terms of the um, governance framework that is there, no one official can ever act unilaterally, including with petty cash. If you identify that you need anything, there's a requester and then there's an approver. There's a delegation framework which assigns who requests, who approves. In this instance, no process was followed. Someone just picked up a phone and said, come and clean this. And we're fortunate that it occurred with a small amount. But the culture of compliance needs to be instilled. We need to make sure that the governance framework in government is respected, which is why the matter is here. And we are confident that this, the, the detection of this matter would have prevented other instances whereby someone would have thought in a, in a public institution they have the same rights that they do in their own house. Thanks. There's bureaucracy at play. Honorable Ngondlo. Honorable Van de Vestese. Akbar Minister. Colleagues. Once again, and members. Members online. Colleagues, once again, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your for your continued work. I have one confession that I wanted to make is that in coming here, I could sense the department, and you mustn't tell them that I told you this, but I could sense that the department wanted to be here. They wanted to be here because there's certain insights that would come up that we can take note of, so that moving forward, these are potential risks that we can always look at. So thank you for the role that you play. Thank you that we are able to appear before you and be interrogated and be questioned. We would be more than welcome for any of those additional um, requests um, that will come via the procedural officer um, to gladly comply. Thank you to the Liquor Authority, to the AG that has been with us for the entire day. Each and every official, thank you so much. We were very serious that we are wanting to be here an entire day, considering all the service delivery um, demands that we have because we honor and we respect the role that 
this parliament plays in duly holding um, the government accountable. Maar weer eens, baie dankie. Ek gaan nie amal sy naam noem nie, but ek wil vir een en elk sê baie dankie, dat ons kan lekker tyd vandag geef het. So, dankie. Um, the HOD can make any closing remarks as well. Thank you. I just want to say thank you. I said to, uh, uh, thank you to the minister as well for his leadership and support. I said to him he's answered more questions than any other minister we've had. Uh, so we're grateful uh, for, for that um, as well. Uh, but then also to, to you, Chairperson, and the committee, uh, the spirit in which the questions were asked. Um, as Minister said, we, we always uh, value your time and your input and the questions that you're asking to hold us accountable. Uh, but also for me to say thank you to, to the team, the department, the uh, entire management team is here, but then also to uh, every one of our staff members as well, because this wouldn't be p possible with, with all, without all of them. Um, and then thank you to the Liquor Authority for the, uh, the la good relationship that we enjoy with them as well. Thank you. The the board. Chair, members, uh, I've been to this chamber many, many years in a very different capacity where I've just reported back to you. Now being accountable to you is a very different role. Um, the liquor board enjoys that role because we are being held accountable. And thank you to you and your members for holding us accountable. CO? Yeah, I can just not Easy. As we're rounding up. Thank you, Chairperson. Lisa spoke the last time, so he nominated me this time. <laughs> um, I think there's nothing really from our side, but also just to echo what the department said. Thank you very much for the questions. They are always stimulating and give great insight. And we look forward to engaging further on, especially our uh, living the realities of our citizens. Mm. Thanks very much. Thank you. I see the audit committees are both gone. Eh? Yeah, okay, that's fine. We need to audit them. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm doing all this uh, in closing up just to also signify the fact that the issue of account accountability, in order for it to be successful, it's a collective effort. We all belong into this thing called accountability ecosystem. And each one must play his or her meaningful role in making sure that we really value the ideal of accountability. In that regard, uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister and the department uh, led by the HOD for always being available when we request you to come and uh, answer the uncomfortable questions and when we ask them we are not intending to catch you up or we are not on a witch hunt at all we just making sure that we are fully fulfilling our role and responsibility of holding the executive to account and we thank you for your cooperation in that and of course we are not doing i can also say the same as well to the liquor board as well i know you've been coming a number of time also to come and accompany uh, your respective department and of course our work is also being done uh, uh, much is being made much more easily by our accountable allies in the Auditor General, our reliable allies in the accountability ecosystem, the Auditor General. Thank you very much for that. It's been a long day, and then when they, for some reason they've put up a, the liquor board, the liquor authority to, on a Friday. We were expecting that we're going to get something, we're expecting that it might because it's a Friday, but thank you very much uh, for your presence. And I think uh, the meeting is going to come to an end so far as the department as well as the liquor board is concerned. Thank you very much. Uh, as the committee, we are going to continue with our work in finalizing that. But I think in allowing you to leave, we are just going to break for 10 minutes. In the meantime, there's refreshments outside. Please uh, make sure that we are enjoying that. As the committee will be back at uh, uh, 
at half past half past four. Yes, we, we thought we thought the refreshment will be. with 14 clean audit uh, but mm -hmm. quite a number of issues that you raise are there any resolution honorable fund investation that you'd like to raise thank you chair um well the, the normal one of of obviously recognizing the this unqualified with and no noting. finding but for me my biggest concern was regarding the liquor board and the um, severe under collecting of income and the severe yeah. under expenditure as well that, that we've seen, you know, we're talking more than 20%. As we've said, 2% seems to be within treasury guidelines. Yeah. But to have a, 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 a variation of more than 20%, uh, almost 23% seems to be quite excessive. And my question would be that we ask of them, why then di didn't you, during the adjustment process, uh, you know, uh, adjusted your estimates uh, in terms of your budget uh, downwards so that the final deviation at the end of the year is not as big as, as, as we've experienced. And then secondly, Chair, uh, they say that they expand in their notes on the reasons for the deviation, 
but I would like us to to have a little bit more insight, be given some insight into the the real reasons for those uh, deviations. And then thirdly, Chair, I, you, you heard my concern about the fines uh, and then you heard the CFO saying, you know, if they then say we're going to close down your establishment, then suddenly people do pay their fines. Mm. I, I, I do not find that uh, a very, can I call it, scientific approach to <laughs> to collecting the fines, etc. I, I, I would like street to... Streetwise, streetwise. Yes, it's yes. Like, can, can, I, can I say, I, I would love us to get their standard procedure for for the collection of, of, of fines or, you know, for demanding that fines be paid. What is their debt collection process when it comes to when it comes to fines? Because it, it seems to be as if it could be open to uh, personal, you know, interpretation. If I if I want to give you more time, I don't threaten you that I will close down your establishment. Mm -hmm. If I don't like you and I want you to pay immediately, then you know, I, I threaten that I will take your. Is, is there is there a more objective basis for for treating uh, entrepreneurs that you know uh, uh, have been fined? Thank you. Honorable uh, Ngondo. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, okay, I support uh, Member Andrikas uh, on the proposal. And then, uh, Chair, I would I would uh, maybe just a request from the department, uh, I think on the issue of location, um, perhaps it's a matter that could be uh, forwarded to the standing committee, um, also jointly to the one on economic development uh, to take up that conversation because it, Whilst it's a governance issue, it's more a standing committee uh, a matter, uh, just to understand the progress in the amendment and what are the stakeholder engagements that are being held particularly. I think they indicated that they have not started public participation as, as, as yet. So that's the, that's the first one uh, for, for, for me, Chair. Um, I think at this point, Chair, I think I would, because the other matters are more straightforward. Mm. I don't think there's anything that I would request a report on. Thanks. Honorable Bosman. Thank you, Chairperson Chair. I just wanted to also share some information um, with the committee in terms of what transpired this morning. Uh, the, um, are you able to hear me, Chairperson? Okay. Can you repeat, Honorable Postman? Um, I just wanted to share some information in okay. terms of the progress. Are you able to hear me, Chair? Yes, yes, yes. So we, the committee also requested um, information on the timelines for the amendments to the Western Cape Community Safety Act. And uh, the department indicated that the act is not ready for public participation yet, and that it has been... Um, it's currently in the um, technical phases. So we are very happy to share with the committee the documents we've requested as well to save the committee some time um, on the update. But I wanted to add to Honorable Fund of Estesen's first resolution um, and maybe ask the department to perhaps tell us how much of the underspending and also the undercollection was due to the department operating over the COVID year as well, because the year under review was a COVID year. Um, so I just wanted to get that to uh, the question. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Postman. Just on my side, just one issue which seems to be recurring is going to be recurring as well. Maybe when the department come back to see us next time, they must just explain how will they address this issue of the, uh, the risk of underfunding for the LIP program. So they indicated that uh, actually that is a risk as well. Look, this uh, uh, initiative started uh, quite very well, but it would be, although I know it was temporary, but then maybe when they come to us as to whether how are they going to deal 
with the problem moving forward. How, how are they going to address it so that it can not continue as a risk? Because there seem to be the depletion of funding on that on their on that part of the link program. On if there is no others, then honourable members, thank you very much uh, once again for your diligence and also for your resilience on a Friday. It was very good again also from on your side or. Uh, Mr. David, thank you very much uh, for your dedication. And the meeting is closed, honorable members. Thank you very much. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned.